Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope all is well. Hope everything's going all right. Hope everybody had a great weekend. And ready to get this one started. Let's see. We should be in. Today. All right. So, does anybody have any questions or anything? Any problems? And uh, anything you want to see me do before we go any further? Is everybody all right? Everybody okay? Yeah, so everybody's good. Everybody straight. Um, okay. So looking at. Hold on, somebody's coming in. So looking at where we are in the class, we, uh, if no one has any questions, no one have any problems for me to do. Uh, we finished 14, seven last class, I believe that was 14 seconds, seven. So we're looking at uh, 17, one today and start from there. So we have chapter 17 and then we have chapter 18 as far as lecture content to cover, new material to cover. And then from there, it'll just be about reviewing and getting you guys uh, to knock those tests out. You know what, they're 75% or better. All right, everybody good? Any questions on that? That's great. Okay, so let's get to the notes. Awesome, in the chat. Yep, I teach pre-calc. Yep, do it every semester. I think I got one next. I know I got a free count two next semester. We got to check and see if I got a free count one. But yep, yep, we'll definitely teach free count. All right, so let's look at our uh, 17 one. Radical expressions. So just emphasizing the relationship between, um, <clears throat> excuse me, your radicals and your exponents. Whenever you have a square root, if you don't see anything there, they assume you know that the index is going to be two. That's what I was saying here. And when you don't see anything there, they assume you know there's a two there. So your exponent is going to be x to the one half. Those two mean the same thing x to the one half and the square root of x are the same thing. So then if you have the cube root of x, that's gonna be x to the one third, fourth root of x is x to the one fourth. And if you have something like the 100 root of x, it's x to the one over 100 power. Yeah, I'm just saying that those mean the same thing. All right, can I scroll up? All right, so if we look at the square root of four, just make sure we're okay with what it means for something to be under the square root. Um, notice I put in green, whatever's under your radical. And let me say it like this. I pointed it here in the red that that is your radical. This is your radical right here. The square root is your radical. And then what's under your radical is your radicand. So that's what I was emphasizing here. So 64 is called your radicand. Um, so whenever you're looking at the square root of a number, you're asking to yourself what times itself twice will give you that number. So in this case, we're looking at 64. What times itself twice will give me 64? And that's eight. 
because eight times eight will give me 64. So when you're looking at square root, that's how you should be processing what they're asking you. What times itself twice will give you 64? So if I have cute root, you asking yourself what times itself three times? What times itself three times will give you 64? And in this case, it's four. Four times four times four will give you 64. So the index of your radical, you know, tells you how many times you're looking for, and it has to give you what's under that radical. Questions on that? Scroll up. And so then looking at the square root of 121, that's 11, because 11 times 11 will give me 121. Then the next one, the square root of negative 121, the answer you will put is not a real number because there's no two numbers. There's no one number when you multiply it times itself will give you a negative number. So that's why I was emphasizing right here. Oops, there my stuff on. That's why I was emphasizing right here. Negative times negative will give you positive. So there's no number that if you multiply it times itself twice will give you a negative number. So whenever you take the square root of a negative, and if you take a square root of a negative, your answer is going to be not a real number. Any questions, any questions? Oh yeah, and this one down here, notice the difference in the positioning of your negative. If your negative is on the outside of the radical, you can still uh, work with that. Um, that negative is not affected by the radical. So you take the square root of 121, which is 11. And since you have a negative sitting on the outside, you have a minus 11 or negative 11 is your final answer. Once again, that's because the negative was not under the radical. It was on the outside. Yep, 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 we should have some time. Make sure you pick out the problems that you want, you know, want me to do, you know, before we get there, so yeah. All right, next one, we're looking at cube root. So if you have the cube root of eight, that's going to be two because two times two times two is eight. Now notice here we have the cube root, we have the cube root of eight, of negative eight. Before we had the square root. So remember, you know, different roots call for different applications. Before we're looking at the square root, you cannot multiply a number times itself twice to give you a negative number. That's why it was not a real number. But now here we're looking at the Q root. Now, if you multiply a negative two times itself three times, you will get a negative number. These two negatives will cancel to give you a positive and that leaves you with a negative left. So you still have a negative number. So that's the difference between looking at um, even root versus an odd root. So make sure you know adhere to the indexes. So you can take the cube root of a negative value 
you cannot take the square, the square root of a negative value. I'm going to close ones. That was it. Okay. So the next one, fourth root of 81. What times itself? Four times will give you 81. That would be three. So that's why your answer is three. Then when you look at the fourth root of negative 81, that's going to not be not a real number, just like with the square root. Because once again, what times itself? Four times will give you a negative number. There is not one. When you look at the fourth power of negative three, those negatives will cancel and leave you a positive nine, positive nine, which will be a positive 81. So you always got to make sure you're paying attention. Do you have to the fact that you have an even root versus an odd root? You know, if you have an even root, then you can't take the even root of a negative. But if you have an odd root, you can take the, the odd root of a negative. Any questions? All right. And then this next one, just once again, emphasizing the, the um, application of an odd root versus an even. Notice we have an odd, we have the fifth root of 32 is going to be two because two times two times two times two times two is 32. And then the fifth root of negative 32 is going to be negative two. Once again, we have an odd root here. And when you multiply it out, negative two times negative two is four, negative two times negative two is four. Bring down that other negative two, four times four. 16 times negative two. That'll give you negative 32. So I wrote out those statements about even versus odd. I want to give you a chance to finish copying that. So even index of the radical cannot take the root of a negative number without the result being imaginary. So that's why I say not a real number. Uh, might go dark. So that's why we're saying not a real number. And then the odd index of the radical can take the root of a negative number. So if it's even, you cannot take the, take the root of a negative. If it's odd, you can. Any questions? Any questions? Let's go look. So use of absolute value. So there is going to be a, an exercise wherein if, uh, if it doesn't say assume your values are positive or your variables are positive, 
you will have to use absolute value. So notice it says if n is even, then the nth root of n to the nth power is going to be absolute value of x. And if, I, if n is odd, then the nth root of x to the nth power is just going to be x. So the reason why they do that is because they want to ensure that they get the positive value. Um, let's go up. So basically, if you look at the square root of 25, you know, you ask yourself what two numbers or what number multiplied times itself will give you 25. There are actually two scenarios that could occur. It's positive five times positive five or negative five times negative five. Both will give you positive 25. So all they're saying is that they want the positive result. So don't forget the absolute value always yield a positive result. So this is the one that they want. And that's why you use the absolute value when dealing with uh, nth roots. All right, so. Here's what we're talking about. Looking at the square root of x squared. The square root and the square will cancel. So that'll leave you with just x. And all they're saying is what they want is the absolute value of x because it was even. Cute root of x. Q would just be x. Fourth root of x to the fourth is x, absolute value of x. So notice what we're doing here, the even roots and the even powers, you're doing absolute value. The odds, you just write the x for itself. And so here we have the 101st root of x to the 101st power. Because it's odd, we just write x. Then the even root, we have 200 root of x to the 200th power is even, so we use the absolute value of x. Any problems with the process and what they're asking of you? All right, so the next one we have the apps, not absolute value, the square root of a plus b squared. Now the square root and the square will cancel just like in the previous problems. So because it's even, we're going to do absolute value of a plus b and leave it like that. And then the next one, the 13th root of a plus b to the 13th power. Just a plus b. And that's because of the i index. Any questions? All right, so the next uh, exercise, simplify 
and then assume all variables are positive real numbers. Notice we're assuming that all values are positive real numbers. If we're assuming that, then we don't have to do this. So just you know, keep in mind, make sure you watch the directions. Um, they may even say up here, use absolute value when necessary. You know, so you know that you're doing it first exercise. But once it starts saying, assume all variables are positive real numbers, we do not have to use absolute value. That's all I was emphasizing right here because absolute value, you know, make sure you have the positive number or the positive result. But if we're gonna assume all variables are positive, then I don't need, you know, the absolute value. All right, I scroll up. All right, so, and that means what we're doing here now. Hold on. Sorry, I had to sneeze. Didn't want to sneeze in the mic. So now what we're doing is when we take the square root of x squared, it's just going to be x. All right, so we have the square root of 81, a to the eighth, b to the sixth, C to the second power. So we would take the square root of each one of them individually. Square root of 81 is nine, because nine times nine give me 81. Then when it comes to the exponents, you're gonna take half, because remember the square root represents half as an exponent. You're gonna take half of each one of your variables. So that's, going to be four, three, and then one for my variables, A, B, and C. Questions on what we did there to simplify. All right, let's go to the next one. So the next one, we had the fifth root of 32, x to the 20th, y to the 15th. So take the fifth root of each one of them individually. And that's the same thing, same thought process. Um, when we look at our exponents, we know the fifth root of 32 is going to be two because two times two times two times two times two, you know, two times itself five times will give me 32. Now, when I look at those exponents, we divide the five into the 20, that'll give me four for X, for the X's exponent, and then divide five into the 15, that's three for the Y's exponent. Questions, any questions? All right, next one. We have the Q root of 27x to the 21st power over 125, y to the 39th power. So you take the Q root of each piece. Q root of 27 is three. Then you take your three divided into 21 for the exponent would be X to the seventh. Q root of 125 is five. And then three divided into the exponent of Y would be 13. Any problems with that one? Everybody good before we uh, touch in 17 2. Um, <clears throat> 
All right, 17.2, rational exponents. So it's leaning more on this relationship of the square root is equal to one half power. You know, and all the other relationships, Q root is one, one third power and so on. So if you have 36 to so the one half power, it's the same thing as the square root of 36, which is six. Six times itself twice, six times six is 36. 343 to the one third power. It's Q root of 343, which would be seven. Then 625 to the one fourth power is the same thing as the fourth root of 625. And that'll be five. That's five times five times five times five. It'll be 625. Any problems? All right, so don't forget the effects of a negative exponent. If it's negative, you can bring it down to your denominator. So if I have 36 raised to the negative one half to make it positive, bring it down to your denominator. So it's one over 36 to the one half equal to one over six. If I have 100 raised to the negative one third power, do the same thing, bring it down to the denominator to make it positive. Q root of 1,000 is going to be 10. 10 times itself three times will give you 1,000. Any questions? In this one, I was just emphasizing uh, if you had a negative, um, you know, these two negatives right here are different negatives. They negative to negative don't turn positive here. You know, that's this just says take it down to your denominator. So I just don't want to think that you know, you know, when we multiply two negatives together, they'll turn positive, but negative your exponent and a negative for your regular number don't affect each other in that same way. So to make that positive, this exponent positive, you bring it down to your denominator. So notice it's positive down here, but it's negative 1,000 is still there. So once again, that negative had no effect on the negative out front. And then uh, the Q root of negative 1,000 just be negative 10. All right, any questions on that before we go to the next thing? All right, next relationship, x to the a over b power. So notice what I wrote in the red. Your numerator is always your power. Denominator is always the root. So if you notice, I have the b root of a to the eighth power, or you can do the b root of x. I said a to the eighth power, x to the eighth power, or you can do the b root of x. Uh, to the eight power. So it doesn't matter which way you apply it, which order you apply it. So you can either do the root first, then the power, or the power first, then the root. It doesn't matter. Just remember that your denominator is your root and your numerator is your power. So you just have to hold true to that and you'll be all right. So the next example, just showing you how no matter which order you do it in, you'll still get the same answer. So if I ha have a to the two thirds power, once again, the two is your power, so that's your square. And the three in your denominator is your root. So it's a cute root. So I first, when I did the cute root of eight, 
And then I was gonna square that. So Q root of eight is two, two squared is four. The second one, I decided to apply the square first and then the Q root. So eight squared is 64, Q root of 64 is four. So either way you'll get four. Just, um, just gotta make sure you apply it properly. Let your denominator be your root, numerator being your power. Any questions? All right, so, so the next one we have 49 to the three halves power. So this time our numerator is three, denominator is two, so that's going to be the third power and the square root. So now, once again, it doesn't matter which order you do it. Just remember, now, if you're doing the calculator, it doesn't matter, but if you're doing this by hand, it would matter because you want to deal with familiar numbers. So the first way that I show you would be the way I would do it if I was doing it, of course, by hand. I would take the square root of 49 first, which is seven, and then cube seven, and that'll give me 343. Now, if you go the other way, in other words, take the square root of 49 cubed. What you're saying is I'm going to cube 49 first. And notice the situation that you're placing yourself in. You have to do 49 times 49 times 49. And that's not familiar for us. All right. So 49 times itself three times isn't a familiar number. So I wouldn't even go that route if I didn't have to. I would just do this one. I just showed you in the previous example. It doesn't matter which order you do it. Uh, it doesn't matter which order you do it, you still get the same answer. So, All right. Um, any problems? All right, so here, same type of deal. We have negative four raised to the three halves power. That means that the de denominator, once again, is our root. So we have the square root and then the third power. So if you notice how this works out for us, we have that negative four that's being applied by this power. Taking the square root of a negative, remember we'll always yield, not a real number. So it doesn't matter what order you do it in. Um, you take the square root of negative four first and then cube it. Or if you cube negative four first and then take the square root of it, either way you will be taking the square root of a negative number. So that will not be a real number, that will be your result. Any problems, any problems? All right, so the next one. 1 over 16 to the 1 fourth power minus 1 over 81 to the 1 half power. So you would take the fourth root of 16, the square root of 21.
So fourth root of 16 is one half. Fourth root of 81 is not the fourth root square root of 81 would be nine. So that's why you have one over two minus one over nine. Now you have fractions that you have to subtract. So you need a common denominator. That's going to be 18 for us. Notice how I multiply both top and bottom by nine, top and bottom by two to get that 18 in the denominator. So that'd be nine over 18 minus two over 18. That'd be seven over 18 as our answer. Any problems with that? All right. Let's look at a few more. So if you have x to the one third times x to the five thirds, don't forget your principles. Just because they're fractions doesn't change what you would do. Um, if you had x squared times x to the fifth, you would just add your exponents. So the same thing happens here. One third plus five thirds. Just add your exponents. We have the same variable, same base. So you just add your exponents. That would be six thirds. Six over three, be two. So that would be x to the second power. All right. Next one, we have seven, seven to the one third over seven to the four thirds. So this time we're dividing. So once again, hold true to your exponential rules. Whenever you're dividing, you're subtracting your exponents. So that's what we did right here. So one third minus four thirds is gonna be negative three thirds. Negative three over three is just negative one. And to make that positive, drop that seven to the negative first power down to your denominator. So it'd be one over seven. Any questions? All right, so C, x to the two thirds times x to the one third minus x to the fifth. So just like any other time that we have a term or number sitting on outside of parentheses, we have to distribute it. x to the two thirds times x to the one third minus x to the two thirds times x to the fifth. All right, so we add our exponents for each individual term. So that's what we did right here and then right here. Here we already had common denominators, two thirds plus one third will give you three thirds. Here we need to get common denominators and that's that word over here. So two thirds plus five over one. That five over one, you would turn it into 15 over three. So you can add it to the two thirds, multiply top and bottom by three. So that would be 17 over three 
And that will be my new fraction right here for my exponent. And then here, this three over three simplifies to one. So that would be x minus x to the 17 over three power. Any problems? All right. Okay, so that's it for seventeen two. Uh, second. Yeah, that's 173. 173 right here. Okay, cool. All right. So any questions I know we had, I had a, uh, one of your classmates ask me a problem about 13.1. So I'm going to go to 13.1. But any questions on uh, anything else as far as what we did today before I go to another chapter? Is everybody all right? Everybody okay? All right, so um, I'm going to see, uh, go to 13.1 real quick. If you don't have any questions and you don't want to stick around for this question, then uh, that's all we're going to do today as far as new lecture is concerned. So if you're good to go, um, you are dismissed and I'll see you next class and I'll uh, have a good one. All right, now let's go to the chat. Thank you, have a good day. All right, thanks. Have a good one, man. Take care. All right. So what problem in 13.1 did you want me to look at, sir? Um, it was finding the DCF of the problems. So it was 50x to the seventh power with... Right. Hold on one second. I'm trying to get to a clear space. All right, let me just add a, another review page. Oh, got there. Okay, cool. All right, so you said 50x to the seventh? Yes, sir. With mm -hmm. negative 10x to the eighth mm -hmm. and 2x to the ninth. That's plus 2x to the ninth. Okay. So first thing you want to do is look at what do each one of these numbers in the front of your variable have in common. Mm -hmm. So when you look at 50, you know, all of them are even. So that's two times 25. 10 is two times five. And then two is just two. So if nothing else, you know you're gonna have two sitting, sitting up front. Two is the only thing that's in common with all of those because that's the only thing that's left for this, just two, right? So two is what's in common with all of those. And then when you look at your X's, you have seven X's here, eight X's here, and nine X's here. So the most that you can pull out of all three would be seven, right? Because you can't pull um, you can't pull nine x's out of a seven. So the most you can pull out of each one would be x to the seven. So that's going to be your GCF. Now, when you talk about what's left, when you go to what's in the parentheses. If I take two away from this, what's left is 25, right? And I put all of my sevens out here so no Xs are left right here, all right? Now, when I go to the 10, if I take two out of that, I'm left with five. And seven of my Xs are up front, so it leaves me with one X here. And then when I look at this two, I took the two and placed it out front, so I don't have a number out here. But I do have seven X's out front, so that means I'll be left with two. And so now if you were to distribute that back, then I should get this, this statement back. 
right. So do you see how that works? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, if all they asked for was the GCF, then all you would do is put that in for the answer. But there will come a point in time where they would want this whole thing. So I'm just showing you the whole process. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if it says factor, I would be doing that back backwards, basically. Yep. If you're factoring is the reversal of uh, multiplication. So that's what this is. You're, you're reversing the, the distribution process. So, and then, so if you were to multiply it back out, that gives you what you originally had, but right. Factoring is the reversal of multiplication. Okay. Do you have another one that you want to see? Uh, yeah, 18 X to the fifth. Mm -hmm. Negative six x to the six and two x to the seventh plus two. He said plus two. No, I meant to tell you it was plus two x seven. Oh, okay, uh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so same type of vibe here. Uh, all three of them are even, so you know if nothing else, you can pull out a two. And the only thing that you have back here is two. So let's look at um. Uh, let me divide this with this. And so we look at 18, that's two times nine. Six is two times three. And like I said, all we have back here is two. So when you're looking at the GCF, you know, you're gonna pull a two out. And then when you look at each one of your exponents for your X, the most you can pull out of all of them is gonna be the least one, which is five. So that means X to the fifth would be on the outside. And then from there, if I pull a two out of this 18, I'm left with nine. I took the X to the fifth and placed it out front. So all that would be left is the nine. Take two out of six, you're left with three. If I take five of the X's out, I'm left with one here. And then I took the two, placed it out front, but I had seven X's originally. So that leave me with two X's when I took five of them and put them out front. So will they always be even or will it be a mix of both? Um, let's say if this was a, uh, that could have been, let's say if this was, uh, I mean, cause it could be anything. Let's see if I want to do, let's say if I did 21 right here. Now I'm looking at, okay, what do all three of these have in common? So if I were to break up this 18, that's two times three times three. I look at that 21, that's three times seven. So now I'm pulling three out of each. You see what I mean? So it's always about evaluating your numbers and seeing what do they have in common that you can pull out of all three. Okay. Yeah, so if I were to do that one, that would be three X to the fifth. So if I were to pull three out of this, I'm still left with two times three, which is six. If I pull three out of this one, I'm left with two. And then if I pull three out of this, I'm left with seven X squared. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, no problem. You have a good one. All right, thanks. You just saying, let me know if you have any other questions. Anybody else for a close? Um, all right, have a good one.